Welcome. My name is Don Young, developer advocate working with the Engagement Cloud of products at Sitecore. This cloud consists of CDP Personalize, Sitecore Send, Moose Send, as well as a few other products. Today we will be continuing from where I left off last time on creating a web experience template. The link to that video is down in the description below, so definitely check that out if you haven't done so already. The focus in today's video is on testing that web experience that we pre created previously. Walking through the steps to debug and to make sure that that web experience is working correctly. This video is intended for a, a broader audience, for developers as well as marketers, because everyone needs to know how to test and make sure that their web experiences are cor working correctly when they're creating a web experience. And then finally, we're gonna cover some additional tidbits that are important when working with a web experience. These are geared a little bit more towards the developer because it talks a little bit about the behind the scene actions that take place when you publish a web experience. So let's go ahead and jump in. So we're still on our web experience, the experience demo that we created. So I wanna show the first type of kind of testing that we can do, which we actually already have seen, which is inline rendering. So to do that, we can just click on edit, and this is inline rendering. You must make sure that when you create a web template that you are specifying that option so you can see this interface. So that's a pretty simple uh, option for you, but uh, just make sure you always select that option, and then this is an option that's available to you. The next one is the API response. Um, so the best way to see those API response tests is to go to advanced edit. And so once you go and click on that, you're actually gonna see the same sort of uh, elements that you would see in the web experience template definitions that you would create. Um, but now this is specific to your web experience. So to do this, there's kind of two interfaces. One is within the data, which you've already seen. Uh, this is where you can kind of, um, you know, select a different user and then apply that. And now you can see all the variables over here on the right. The other experience is the preview API option. And so what this option does is allows you to specify different variances, which is pretty useful. You can also then change which guest profile that you're using, which is similar to this right, uh, right interface. Um, but you can then send the request and then you can see what data comes back from the API response that we have selected. So you can kind of run through different tests and, and get a good at indication of any failures or any issues that you might have in your, in your code or your web experience. The next option, which I think is probably one of the better options, um, is the preview buttons. If we go navigate back to our web experience, there's a lot of preview buttons all over the place, and they all do the, essentially the same thing. There's a preview option here, gives you an option to type a URL, we'll type that in a second. There's a preview option here, gives you an option to type in a URL. You can click edit, and then click preview, and there's an option to type in a URL. And there's also one here as well. I mean, you're, you're never too far from a preview option when you're working with a web experience. And so now I'll go ahead and just create a, a preview URL. I'm gonna use my local host environment. Like I said uh, previously, this will only work for me. So if you're doing these tests locally, you can definitely do that and that's great. Um, but if you want to, what's great about these preview URLs is you can pass, once it generates the full uh, query string for your preview URL, then you could pass those off to stakeholders, etc., for them to view. However, if it's a local host environment, you're not gonna be able to do that because they won't have access to a local host environment. I don't think it likes the trailing slash. So I'll save and go. And so now you see that there's a query string here, and this basically is using a kind of a demo mode for your website using these special parameters that are passed in, allows it to kind of pull that draft 
web experience that we defined. It's not published yet, but it's able to, it's, it's kind of like a, a sandbox type environment. By using these parameters, it's able to pull those tests or those draft states. And so you can actually see I, I've pulled it in. It doesn't look very good. I wasn't trying to make it look particularly that good, but CSS styling, I'll need to apply uh, in that CSS tab to make it look better. And so you can actually do a little bit more than that. You can also pass in a, include a guest in the preview. So if I wanted to pull Ahmed's uh, domain in there, uh, I can now go with that instead. Honestly, it doesn't really change the test scenario just because there is nothing that, we're not using the guests details to change the web experience in any way. Uh, we could show the web experience could show the person's name like, hi, Ahmed, this is a great blog post for you, for example. Then the last option, which actually is, is represented in, in this, is there is this QA tool that you can also use. And you don't have to use the query strings. It comes with the query strings when you do the preview option, but you can also just run it randomly whenever you want. So if I would just use question mark BX QA tool equals true, in that syntax, in that uh, format, uh, capitalization format, then it will basically load these two buttons on the left. You saw those buttons before when we did the preview as well. Um, but those, if you click on the first one, it shows you a couple different options. Uh, you can change who's the guest. Um, you can just run as a guest if you want to. You can change the variant that it's using. Uh, this also shows you as the variant runs, uh, different kind of green check marks means that those things ran successfully and everything looks good. If you had issues there, then it might show yellow or red if there's issues as it tries to run this web experience. There is a toggle here where you can see the API response. And then it also, you know, just some other flows here. Um, you can also see all the production flows that you already have enabled. So. Uh, this represents a draft state, but obviously this represents production flows or, or flows that you have published. So pretty useful tool. All right, that's it. Uh, let's jump back to the slides. So now let's talk about some of the publishing and execution logic that takes place after you have uh, published your web experience. What kind of steps or processes take place uh, to get that logic into a production state? As most see it, uh, you click the publish option, you wait a few seconds and done, magic. Suddenly everything works, but it's not quite that simple. Uh, there's a lot of things that are happening behind the scenes. There is a push of JSON logic or JSON payload of all the production experiences, even including the one you just triggered to publish to an AWS Lambda function. These are very similar to Azure functions or um, anything of that sort, if you're familiar with that terms. That JSON payload writes files to S3, those files being JavaScript files. The S3 files are then, or JavaScript files in this uh, state, are picked up by the CDN, and then the uh, Sitecore CDP JavaScript library will use those files from the CDN. So those Lambda functions are taking the JSON payload, as previously mentioned, of the live experiences or the ones that have been published and bundles them into JavaScript files. There are five different files that get created. There's really only two that matter for the consumer, the customer. There is the version.js or the minified version of that, uh, which lives at the root. Uh, the path is below. This I'll talk about in a second. And then there's the library version, which contains uh, it sits inside a version number folder and it contains all of our web experiences that are in production. So as previously mentioned, the version.js file gets created. Uh, this only is loaded by Sitecore CDP JS library if, in this case, Webflow target is present, but really if the web experience is enabled, if that's the case, then this is our loaded. And this file contains just very basic information. It really just contains the library version or the lib version that it needs to reference. 
This file is never cached. So every time you publish out a new thing, it will create a new lib version. This will reference that new lib version. So this needs to be updated at that point. And so caching can't be an option here. And then that will help load that lib version JS. So the lib.js contains the JSON of live experiences and code to execute them. Starts by getting a bucket number if one doesn't exist for the user. We talked about that previously about the cookie, so I won't cover that again, but that's the bucket number is just used to help determine the variant. Uh, this will loop through all the live experiences, web experiences, and checks if you fall within a variant based on the bucket number. If a variant matches, then it will call the API to get the variant details. And if that returns a valid response, then it runs the handlebars JS compile to basically take all those parameters and turn it into actual values in your HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And it will also return a JSON API response. This will then insert your CSS into your site as well as executes the JavaScript, which injects the HTML into the site. Uh, this also has the logic for creating debug config used by the QA tool and inserts if enabled. So if you have that query string in your path or if you have that cookie, then it will inject it. And the, these are these files are cached forever. So they're immutable. Basically, every time you release a new uh, web experience, a new lib file gets created and then that lib file is cached forever. All right, so I've loaded up my personal website and I've opened up Chrome Tools, F11, I believe it is. I've refreshed so that my network tab is populated. And so you can see some of this stuff being loaded. There's the version.min that was referenced, the JS library. Um, you'll also notice that the lib.min is also here. Uh, this is the immutable file that changes each time. So that demonstrates today these scripts loading on your website when you add the JS library to your website and are creating a web experience. This concludes today's topic on debugging a web experience. Thank you and until next time, good luck with using these techniques to debug your own web experiences. Goodbye.